Okay, so in this um, video, I'm going to explain accounts receivable, bad debt expense, and allowance for doubtful accounts, okay? So what is accounts receivable? Accounts receivable is related to the credit sales of merchandise to a customer where credit to 30 from 30 to 60 days is, is extended. So basically, the difference between an accounts receivable and other um, types of receivables, such as notes receivable, is that you're not going to have a formal note, a formal promissory note, um, describing the debt. For a notes receivable, you'll have a note that's specifically related to that debt, and it'll state the principal amount, the interest, the time to maturity, and so forth and so on. But for accounts receivable, you don't have this. It's simply um, the usual business that you conduct with your customers and the amount of money that your customers owe you. Now, you may keep um, something written down to say, well, how much the limits that I am willing to extend um, credit to to certain customers, but there's no um, formal notes um, directly linking a specific transaction and time of payment for a specific purchase of merchandise or a sale from your part to them of merchandise okay so accounts receivable is one of the biggest um, line items in the balance sheet of course because that's where you book the majority of your sales when you have a sale you either um, credit sales revenue or you will debit if they pay cash you will debit cash if they don't pay cash and they um, choose to your customer chooses to um, pay within 30 to 60 days then you will debit account receivable um, and so most most customers will probably pay within 30 to 60 days they usually don't pay immediately um, and so the account receivable line is pretty big and so companies do want to have a lot of accounts receivable right Unless, of course, you have a lot of accounts receivable because you're not collecting on them, then that's a bad thing because um, then that means that your sales, you're selling, but you're not you're not receiving cash inflow. But, but all things equal, assuming you're collecting on them, you want to have high accounts receivables, right? You want to see them increase. Um, accounts receivable is considered a current asset because it is highly liquid. You know, a current asset is an asset that's going to be used within the operating cycle or, or one year or less, right? And so it is a current asset. Um, many companies um, package their accounts receivable and sell them off um, to other companies, but that's, you know, slightly beyond the scope of this, of this chapter. Uh, but that's called factoring. Anyways, the important thing is to know is that accounts receivable is a big line item in the balance sheet and it represents sales revenue that have not been paid in cash and that will be paid within 30 to 60 days and for which there's no formal written um, promissory note. Uh, the one that has a formal prim written promissory note would be a note receivable. A, yeah, a note receivable basically. Okay. So this is the this is the accounting entry to account for accounts receivable. Uh, you'll have a credit to sales revenue, which is an income statement account, right? And a debit to account receivable, which is an asset and goes to the balance sheet. Okay. But unfortunately, um, this account is going to be in the hundreds of thousands or millions for many companies. And and for most companies, you're not going to be able to collect 100% of your accounts receivable. In other words, many of your customers will not pay on what they're on their debt. So, what do you do about that? Well, you're going to have to um, book uh, uncollectible receivables, right? And where do you book uncollectible receivables? Well, you recognize uncollectible receivables in an account called bad debt expense. Okay. So there are two ways, two methods for accounting for uncollectible receivables. The first one is the direct write-off method. And in this method, you just simply wait till you are pretty much sure that the customer cannot pay you and you go ahead and take the accounts receivable off your books and you book bad debt expense. Example, on May 10th, on May 10, a 4,200 accounts receivable from DL, DL Ross has been determined to be uncollectible. 
the entry to write off the account is as follows. So this is the entry to write that account. You're simply going to go directly and book the bad debt expense and you're going to close the accounts receivable from DL Ross, right? So what happens if DL Ross um, goes ahead and pays for this unexpectedly after we wrote it off? Well, all you do is you reverse this entry up here first. So you will go ahead and credit bad debt expense. It says here, if DL Ross pays it that it's debt on here I say May 29 and then here I have May 28 so that's not let's just make this match it's supposed to be the same thing okay if deal Ross pays its debt on May 28 after it is written off okay so all you do is you reverse this entry up here the first entry to write it off you reinstate the accounts receivable for deal Ross and you um, credit the bad debt expense so now you have zero bad debt expense and now you record the receipt of cash you have cash here and you have a accounts receivable deal Ross will be closed okay now what are some of the um, some of the weaknesses of, of um, recording using the, the direct write-off method well one of the worst things about the direct write-off method is that it's not necessarily matching expenses with revenues, right? Because I, if I sell $100,000 in accounts receivable in year 2011 and I wait to, I wait till I deem some uncollectible, well, I may record the expense in in the year 2012 2013 the bad debt expense the year in which I deemed them uncollectible well what principle does that violate that violates the matching principle right because you're gonna have revenues in 2011 I believe that was my example and then you're gonna record expenses related to that revenue bad debt expense um, in 2012 2013 when they occur and so it, it violates the matching principle right um, so that for that reason, the direct write-off is only permitted when the amount of write-offs is immaterial. Usually when when the entries are immaterial to a company, then FASB permits you to violate GAAP because um, materiality is a big um, uh, requirement. If it's immaterial, usually you can get away with violating GAAP. And in, the, in this type of accounting is a sort of a violation of GAAP. But it is permitted um, when the amount of write-offs is very, very immaterial. Then you don't have to do what I'm going to show you in the next one, which is the allowance method. Okay? The allowance method is different from the direct write-off method because in the allowance method, we make an effort to match the bad debt expense with the revenues so if I like I t said in the previous example if I sold one hundred thousand dollars in accounts revenue in 2011 I am not going to wait till um, the accounts actually become uncollectible to book them because it's not gonna match my revenues and my expenses in the same period I am going to do an estimate of what I believe um, will be uncollectible and I'm going to book it in 2011 that way I can match the, the revenues and the expenses in the same year so in 2011 I'll have 100,000 in sales revenue and if I think that 1% of my sales revenue is not going to I'm not going to be able to collect it I will book 1% which would be 1,000 right and I will book that in, as bad debt expense in 2011 right but I will not um, but I will not uh, close the 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 any accounts receivable directly as in the direct write-off method I'll simply put it in in an account called allowance for doubtful accounts okay so let's look at this example on December 31, 2015, X Tone Company has an accounts receivable balance of 200000 
Xtone estimates that a total of 30,000 of the December 31 accounts receivable will be uncollectible. The following adjusting entry is made on December 31. So Xtone has 200,000 in accounts receivable. It wants to match its bad debt expense to the same year in which it recorded the revenue. And it estimates that there's going to be $30,000 of bad debt expense in the future. So Xtone will go ahead and make the entry now. Bat debt expense thirty thousand, and that will rec with a debit that will recognize the bat debt expense, and that is offset with an account called allowance for doubtful accounts. Now, allowance for doubtful accounts, as you can see up here, this made a little more sense because you were closing directly the customer's accounts receivable, as it was no longer valid, right? Now. You don't have a specific accounts receivable here to close. You're just doing a general estimate of your entire balance. So you will book it into the allowance for doubtful accounts. And this is what is known as a contra account. What it's going to do, it's going to lower your accounts receivable balance. But you want to leave this in a separate line. That way, that way you um, can keep track of it better. So you're going to have accounts receivable of 200000 in this case because the allowance for doubtful accounts is a contra to the accounts receivable. You sort of combine them when you present them in the balance sheet. So the allowance for doubtful accounts, which has a credit balance as opposed to accounts receivable, which has a debit balance being an asset, right? will lower the accounts receivable and you will present the net amount usually companies present the net amount in the balance sheet the 170 they may they may disclose this amount in a note or maybe they'll disclose it in parentheses in the description line of the balance sheet but this is the amount that's usually presented accounts receivable net of allowance for doubtful accounts okay so keep in mind that allowance for doubtful account is simply a contra account for accounts receivable used to estimate the uncollectible accounts and book bad debts and that way in the future so now let this was done in 2015 so if in 2016 there's an uncollectible account you've already booked the expense you've already matched the expense for the same year you'll simply now take it out of the allowance for doubtful accounts the bad debt expense and it won't affect your your year 2016 right so let's take a look at an example in january 21 2016 john parker's account of six thousand dollars with Xtone company is written off notice here how we write off john parker's account for six thousand dollars we close it but we will um credit we will debit the allowance for doubtful accounts, right? We will take it out of here, which is a balance sheet account, not an income statement account. So does your income statement get affected in 2016 for this write-off? No. You already recognize all your expense in 2015 where you should have recognized it because that was the year you um, earned to, you booked the $200,000, right? Look at it this way. Um, I'll try to give you a very quick example. Let's say I have company XYZ, and I know that there's going to be ma a manager manager in year 2015 and a very different manager in 2016. Each manager will be paid based on their um, net income, right? So would it be fair for the manager of 2016 to have to eat all the expenses of 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 the first manager's sales revenue for uncollectability in 2016 no right so if the first manager sold two hundred thousand dollars you should try to anticipate how much of that will be uncollectible and subtract it because that belongs to the first manager and his compensation should be based on 170 not two hundred thousand and it's not fair to transfer some of the uncollectible expenses over to the new manager from 2016 I'm sure he won't be happy and he will complain. So we want to match expenses with the year that the revenues were produced. And this does that as best as we can. We have to use estimates because we really don't know, right? So what happens in 
So it says on January 1, John Parker's account of 6,000 with X tone is written off. Okay, so we write it off like this. It doesn't affect our income statement in 2016. What happens if on February of 16 of 2016, John Parker unexpectedly makes the full payment? Well, very similar to the direct write-off, we come up here, we reinstate the receivable. Um, so we basically reverse this entry down here, and then we record the receipt of cash like if nothing happened. Cash, 6000 accounts receivable, 6000 Notice how um, revenue's income statement is not affected here. You're simply taking cash in 2016 and closing the receivables account, right? The revenue was recognized back in 2015 when it was sold. Okay? So how do we, rec how do we estimate th this allowance here? So I said here that we did um, $30,000 of allowance for doubtful accounts, right? So how do we how do we come up with that number? Well, there's two ways to come up with that number. Well, there's sort of three ways, um, but two main ways. Percentage of sales method, in which a company goes and says, "Well, I sold um, one million dollars in credit sales this year, and my, based on my experience, I don't collect on about 0.75 percent of my credit sales." So that's going to I'm going to add that to my balance on my allowance for uncollectible account. So keep in mind that your whatever you come up with up here, you're going to add it to your balance in un uncollectible accounts, right? So this is called the income statement approach because the income statement method or approach because it's related to the income statement, right? You're you're basing your allowance based on the sales for that year on the credit sales for that year okay another method is the analysis of receivables method the analysis of receivables method is you take a look at your balance sheet this one is tied to the balance sheet you're going to take a look at your balance sheet um, and you're going to estimate uncollectible accounts based on a percentage of the outstanding account balance receivables right now you could do it one of two ways. You can apply a percentage to the entire balance or the more common way is to apply a different percentage to balances that you've tiered based on days outstanding, right? Why? Because the longer accounts receivable is outstanding, the more likely that customer is not going to pay. And so you're going to probably apply a higher percentage to that, right? So let's take a look at um, an example, and this is a very important example because there could be a lot of um, there could be a lot of confusion here. So let's pay attention to to this. Okay, I think it goes up to here. So assume the following data for Xtone Company on December thirty one, two thousand and sixteen, before any adjustments. And when I say before any adjustments, I'm talking about adjustments to the allowance account okay so let's take a look here uh, we have a balance of five thousand dollars in the allowance for doubtful accounts okay so using the percentage of sales method i will go over here and i say what what total um credit sales i've had for the year and the total credit sales for the year was one million dollars and my experience tells me that I don't collect about in about 0.75% of those sales. So all I do is I take um I all I do is I take um 1 million dollars and multiply it by 0.75%. That's going to give me my bad debt expense is 7,500, right? And I'm simply going to go ahead and book that straight into my allowance I here I have a number that's wrong I have 5,000 here and I have 3,250 let's make this 5,000 so that it can match that's the proper um, number okay so this is my opening balance in my balance for doubtful accounts because this is not the first um, entry we've ever made into this account it's right here and we determine the um, amount that we're going to add Remember, this is very important, the amount that we're going to add to this balance based on credit sales. So it tells me um, bad debt expense equals three mil. Again, a number that I have to correct, it equals one million, right? 
So we have 1 million times 0.75% equals 7,500. That's my bad at debt expense for that year, 2016. And I will add this over to this balance. And <coughs> the addition will be my ending balance for allowance for doubtful accounts. Okay? It's important that you distinguish how these are done because there could be very, a lot of confusion. People, when they're starting to learn this, will confuse, well, which one do I add to and which one do I do the other method, which is very different, okay? Because when you do the analysis of receivable methods, and here we're going to do it based on aging of receivables, right? This is known as the aging of receivables method. What we're doing is we're going to calculate the desired ending balance of allowance for doubtful accounts. So this is what we're calculating. We're calculating what the ending balance is going to be. We're not going to calculate, as opposed to this one, where we're calculating what the bad debt expense is going to be, and we're going to add it. This one requires an additional step, right? Because we're, we're calculating the ending balance. So as you can see here, we will, we have, we tier our receivables by different outstanding days, right? And we line up, or we put the balances for each tier. And as you can notice here, the longer the outstanding balance, the higher percentage we apply because logic says that the uh, longer the time period a receivable is outstanding, the less likely we're going to get paid on it, right? So 2% of 135000 is 2700 5% of 45,000 is 2,250, 10% of 35,000 is 3,500, and 20% of 25,000 is 5,000. We add that up and it comes up to 13,450. Is that my bad debt expense? No, absolutely not. So if I ask you a question like that and you'd say, and I say, what's my bad debt expense? And you say 13,450, then your answer is going to be wrong. What we're doing here is we're cal calculating the desired balance for allowance for doubtful accounts. So we know we have 5,000. We want 13,450 down here. So all we do is we take this number, we subtract the 5,000, and that's how we get our bad debt expense. Whatever brings my balance up to 13,450. In this case, it's 8,450. So my bad debt expense is going to be 8,450 and that's how you increase your allowance for doubtful accounts and you're going to increase it by 8,450 okay so notice this distinction based on the method keep that in mind because it's going to be a source of confusion for you in the test and try to learn that very well okay so this is a general summary of um, the three main topics in this chapter which is um, accounts receivable, bad debt expense, and allowance for doubtful accounts. Thank you.